Hi everyone, I'm Tom Perna from Heart AED. Thank you very much for this opportunity to spend some time with you to go over your automated external defibrillator. Before we get into the detail of your particular AED that we'll sort out from the uh, number of them here, um, I do a little introduction as well as some information on, on what sudden cardiac arrest is, its signs, special situations that might arise in a rescue. Uh, all that is so important because if we don't recognize and understand what's going on, having an AED is kind of a moot point because it may not get used. So I, I call this awareness, I want to stress this isn't training uh, because there's not going to be obviously any hands-on practice in a video here. Uh, I will practice with the mannequin uh, in the demonstration. Uh, but I really encourage you if you have not gone through CPR, if it's been a while since you've done CPR, that you consider taking the class. It is literally a, a life skill, uh, not necessarily a work skill, but parents have thought it's a loved one at home or somebody in the neighborhood as well as at your work or, or school. Um, so again, I'm going to just go over what sudden cardiac arrest is, its signs, special situations that might arise in a rescue, and then later on demonstrate. I will attempt in this presentation here, I will attempt a, a little bit of humor. I stress those two words, attempt and little. Uh, don't feel obligated to laugh, and by all means, I don't want to diminish the seriousness of what we're talking about here, the possibility of, of saving a life. With that said, if nothing else from this presentation, just remember one uses an automated defibrillator when the person is unconscious, not responding, and not breathing or not breathing normally. The other way I say that is if a patient ever asks, why are you putting those pads on me, you've jumped the gun. Okay, they're still talking, there's no need to use the AED. It's great you knew where it was, it's great you got it to the scene, but they're not in sudden cardiac arrest if they're still communicating. Frankly, they'd be asking, why are you taking my clothes off first? Because everything from the belt to the neck needs to be off in the use of an AED. With all that said, if there is any doubt as to whether that person is responding, breathing, breathing normally, you've called 911, you started your CPR, you send somebody for the AED, use the AED when it arrives. Any doubt, because as an automated external defibrillator, it will only shock ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, uh, two forms of sudden cardiac arrest, which is an electrical malfunction of the heart. And that's what I'm going to get into next. This is what we're talking about with sudden cardiac arrest. I like to correlate it to a, a classroom, just to give you a little view of it, or a different view of it. And, and what I mean by that, not, not today's classrooms, but a classroom from, say, my generation, sixth grade. Okay? And a classroom is a learning environment. So that function, that learning, I want to correlate to the function of the heart. And the whole function of the heart is to pump blood. It speeds up when we're exerting ourselves, it slows down when we're resting. Okay? So we got learning to pumping blood. Now for that classroom to be a learning environment, one of the things we need are the students in the classroom. So the students, I want to correlate to the heart's electrical system that's telling that heart to contract, relax, contract, relax, to move the blood throughout the body. Okay? So learning, pumping blood, students in the classroom, electrical system telling that heart to pump blood. Sudden cardiac arrest in my sixth grade was when the teacher left the room. Because we'd start bantering, talking, looking out the window. We were doing everything and anything there was to do but learn. And that's what's happening in the heart and sudden cardiac arrest. The electrical system goes all askew. It's doing everything and anything but pumping blood effectively. As a result, the person becomes unconscious, stops breathing normally, stops breathing altogether. Every minute that goes by in that chaotic heart rhythm, there is a 10% less likelihood of survival. Now, one last time back to my sixth grade class. Unlike today's teachers, mine had yardsticks. They restore in that class, they'd take that yardstick, they'd luckily whack it on a desk. Wherever we were, we froze in our tracks. Order was restored very, very quickly. So I want you to consider your automated defibrillator as the yardstick for the heart. If it reads that chaotic arrhythmia, it's going to whack that heart with a bunch of electricity to try to stop that chaos, try to stop that fatal arrhythmia. Very important is that recognition, that call to 911, that compressions, that CPR. Okay, while we're waiting for that AED to arrive, to defibrillate that heart, and then continue on with that CPR afterwards, 
to hopefully have that heart start pumping effectively again on its own. Heart attack is a plumbing issue with the heart. Sometimes you hear somebody was, had a heart attack and they were saved with the use of a defibrillator. And that's technically not true. If the defibrillator delivered a shock, it corrected the electrical malfunction of the heart, where the heart attack is the plumbing issue, the blockage of the coronary arteries. Okay? Now, that signs of that is the shortness of breath, pain in the chest, maybe radiating to the arm and jaw or nausea in the back, um, sweating, uh, things of that nature. Um, in those situations, by all means, call 911. Send somebody to get the AED. These days, you might ask the person that can, they can chew and swallow an aspirin. That might temporarily help with that blockage. But again, you would not hook up the AED. It's good to have it nearby, but you would not hook it up unless the person became unconscious and stopped breathing or stopped breathing normally. Again, you're going to use the AED when the person is unconscious, not responding, not breathing, not breathing normally. Those are the signs of sudden cardiac arrest, the, the second of my four topics. And I want to spend a little more time on this because it's so important, is the recognition. As a society, this is the challenge we have, is the recognition. And I'll do this as an example, correlate it to something unrelated to, to a heart attack or sudden cardiac arrest. Society, over the years, we've gotten to know how to respond to somebody who does this. You've probably thought, okay, well that person's probably choking. You ask them, are you choking? And the person nods because they can't speak, right? If they can't speak, we need to help them. We're going to help you. And you come back around, what do you do with the, the, the abdominal thrust, the Heimlich maneuver, okay, to help that relieve that, that stuck food or whatever it is that they're choking on. And as a society, we've learned that pretty good. When I do presentations and, and pr uh, present that to them, they're confident in the response and how to respond. With sudden cardiac arrest, when we see somebody collapse, we're not so confident. We tend to say, well, what's going on here? We're not so sure. Yeah, the, a person just fell and they hit their head. They, they might have a concussion because they're not waking up. Or, yeah, they have, they're having a seizure. You know, maybe an epileptic seizure. Their, their, their muscles are all contracting and, and, and the like. What's going on with that? We don't always correlate that sudden collapse to the heart. And I would recommend to think of heart first. And let's rule that out. All right, so be aware of those signs upon collapse. Okay? Unresponsive. Not breathing normally or not breathing at all. And initially, there may be seizure convulsion-like activity, all right? If it's aggressive, like an epileptic seizure, you kind of let it run its course. Any doubt, you're calling 911 if you're not sure of the situation or that not aware of what that person's been going through in the past. Send somebody to get an AED. Frankly, any medical emergency, that should be routine. No harm in bringing an AED to a scene. You can just take it right back if it's not used, all right? You will not use the AED on somebody who's seizing and convulsing aggressively. Okay, you gotta kinda let that run its course um, so we can uh, determine exactly what's happening. When, it's, when it subsides, then if they're not responding to you, not breathing normally, then by all means proceed with the AED doing CPR while we're waiting for that AED to arrive. Not necessarily when the seizure ends, but when it subsides. The not breathing normally, and AHA training, American Heart Association training, in the medical term they call it agonal breathing, gurgles, gasps, several seconds between breaths, a snore. If you know somebody who has sleep apnea, they make noises when they're sleeping, you have several seconds between breaths. The difference with sleep apnea, when you tap them to wake them up, there is a reaction, there is a response to your action. In sudden cardiac arrest, when you try to do that, there is no response. Basically, it's the brain trying to tell the lungs and, and, and the heart, I need oxygen. I'm losing oxygen because this blood isn't flowing anymore. So you can hear potential noises like that. Again, they're not responding. You call 911. They're not breathing normally. You're starting your CPR. You've sent somebody for the AED. Use it as soon as it arrives. And obviously, if there's no breathing, it's the same thing. 
that's the topic, second of my four topics as far as the signs of sudden cardiac arrest. Unconscious, not responding, not breathing, not breathing normally. Be aware of potential seizures and convulsions um, and, and that agonal breathing, okay? You realize too that color might not be looking right, you know, bluish and or grayish tint, that might be a possibility as well. Third of my four topics are special situations. I always start with special situations. If it's pouring down rain outside, somebody collapses, you're going to action, all right? And we got a problem here because water and electricity mix. They mix real well. So if you're in a puddle, the patient's in a puddle, the machine's in a puddle, we don't want to be using the AED, all right? If you can't get them out of that situation or keep them dry, you got to do your best to do the CPR. Don't worry about damp concrete or small puddles like, say, on a pool deck, all right? But standing water if they're in it or the AD or you are. If you can drag them out of that, there's no spine or neck injury to get them to a drier place, by all means proceed to do that. All right. Your AEDs have attached uh, to them some type of a rescue kit. In the rescue kit you have a scissors, razor, glove, and mask as well as a wipe. So there's a wipe in here that you could use to dry that chest area off. All right. Because we want that shot going from pad to pad to the heart not potentially arcing across due to that moisture. The razor in there, um, 95 degree day out, gentleman goes to the beach, he removes his t-shirt, he's wearing a sweater. That's my attempt of humor. Uh, a lot of chest hair, okay. In that situation you may want to use that razor to shave the area to place the pads. Now realize with many of the AEDs, your organization may have a spare set of pads with that. When I do the demonstration, I'll show you those. So if you had this set of pads that were pre-connected on and the unit cannot analyze because it's all matted from that hair, rip the pads real fast, likely take the hair with it, and then plug in those spare set of pads to utilize. If you're unsure if you have spare pads or there's just a lot of hair, that razor is there to use. The scissors in your rescue kit is to help cut away that clothing. As I mentioned earlier, everything from the belt to the neck should be off. That includes a necklace and a bra. Just move it away from that chest so we have good access to the chest and have that shock be able to deliver uh, that hopefully a life-saving uh, energy to the heart. Um, so scissors, razor, gloves. Uh, myself, I'm probably not putting gloves on just to do CPR but things could get messy and, and you know, there could be vomit and things of that nature. So there are gloves available in there. And obviously a CPR mask, right? In this presentation, I'm just gonna focus on compression only, CPR, but realize that as time goes on, that oxygen, the body isn't getting much oxygen just from compressions only. So if you know CPR, if you know your 30 compressions, two breaths, 30 compressions, two breaths, there is a CPR mask in there. These days, if you call 911, they likely are just going to tell you to, to do chest compressions and not worry about the breathing, unless it's a, a drowning, a, a drug overdose, carbon monoxide poisoning, or a pre-puberty child, then they will likely try to have you do 30 compressions and two breaths, uh, but otherwise just the compressions. But there is a CPR mask in there that has a filter uh, that if they do vomit or fluids in that nature or breath, it, the filter blocks it to get into your uh, lips and your mouth. So again, that rescue kit is attached. Other special situations, internal defibrillators, internal pacemakers, the size of a Tic Tac container or stopwatch. Normally it's under the skin on the left side of the chest. A uh, person who's unconscious, not responding, not breathing, not breathing normally, that's not doing the job. So by all means, proceed with your response. The chain of survival, American Heart, early recognition, early call to 911, early CPR, okay? And um, obviously advanced life support from there, early defibrillation and advanced life support. So your pad placement is gonna be the same with that unit here or another medical device. Just make sure you don't place the pads. I'll show you an example of the pads here. Um, you just never want to place these pads over the device, all right? Put it at least an inch away. Now with that internal defibrillator being up here, no problem. Your pad placement, as you can see here, is the upper right and the left side rib cage, all right? Some left-handers, evidently, 
may have that internal defibrillator on this side of the chest because of all the movement that they have with their left hand. So in that case, you've got to put that pad at least an inch away, doing your best to sandwich the heart so we can get that shock to the heart. All right? So any medical devices, you want to put it at least an inch away. Your AEDs, if you have formal functions for children under the age of eight, you may have uh, child pads with that unit, or uh, some of the units have a built-in child button. One has a child key that you could use, and those reduce the energy, um, and the pads can be used on the front and back or as indicated. For example, here is a set of child pads, and basically you would unplug the adult pads and plug these in, and this attenuator here reduces the amount of energy for that small child under the age of eight. Your pad placement can be the same as the adult, or if they're within an in, not within an inch of each other, or the front and the back. Just follow along with the picture. And it's so much easier for that small child to get the pad on the back. So again, there's an attenuator. Again, this is for children under the age of eight. My assumption throughout this presentation is that there's more than one person responding to a rescue. It's just not you alone. Um, in an environment of work or school, that likely will be the situation. If by chance you were alone with someone, then uh, in that case, if it's uh, an adolescent or above, call 911, you determine they're not responding, call 911, let them know the situation. Go grab the AED if it's nearby, come back, not really normally hook up the AED and proceed from there. If it's a pre-puberty child, in that case, you would call 911 still, because you have your cell phone, put it on speaker. If they're not responding, not breathing normally, you start your CPR, do two minutes of that CPR. If you can do that 30 compressions and two breaths, fantastic. But then after the two minutes, if the AED is nearby, you would go get the AED, bring it back, and hook it up. Just a side light from that. Uh, before I do the demonstration of your particular AED, I, I do want to talk over two other items. Um, First one is I want to stress there are other heart arrhythmias that, that are not fatal. Uh, supraventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, okay? Uh, that's a, a rapid heart rate in the upper part of the heart. That's the tachycardia, okay? The atrial fibrillation, you see television commercials on AFib, if you will, and medications and things of that nature. That's the chaotic heart arrhythmia in the upper part of the heart. Well, in the upper part of the heart, it's more moving the blood around the area where the lower part of the heart, the ventricular, is what's pushing it all out to the body. So if somebody's complaining about an arrhythmia, my heart's fluttering, et cetera, et cetera, and they might be lightheaded or, or a little short of breath or very tired, they need to sit down, okay? In those situations, if they know what they're doing and how they present it, then, you know, work with them on that. Any doubt, though, call 911, have that AED nearby, okay? But again, in those situations, they're not going to normally lose consciousness. So be aware of that possibility. Realize that we could do everything right, just like we've been talking about throughout this presentation. In fact, there are three industries based on studies that are doing really good in responding. We've really evolved as it relates to automated defibrillators. Uh, one study is airlines. Uh, they do a really good job in responding, recognizing, and use of their AED. Uh, high schools, uh, the small study of high schools are showing improvements tremendously. We do a lot of work here in Michigan with, with schools, K through 12, and in the last seven or so years, we've had 24, 25 saves uh, in Michigan schools in the use of an automated defibrillator delivering a, a life-saving shock. So, so we're definitely evolving uh, in the right direction with regards to that. The other industry, and I can only think that they have a vested interest uh, that are really good in response uh, are casinos. The person collapses, they have great success in, in responding to that person. And the reason for that, if you think of casinos, they got cameras everywhere, they got security watching those cameras. So when somebody collapses, they're able to respond very quickly. That recognition, that early defibrillation, the quicker we can recognize, the quicker we can defibrillate, the better chance we have of a rescue. And for those casinos that patient is back there gambling the next time. So that's my vested interest theory. Um, realize now that like the casinos, and like the airline, like the school, we can do everything right. That early recognition, that early call to 911, that early CPR, that early 
use of the AED. We got that AED hooked up, we're standing clear, everything we've talked about, we're ready either to push the button or some AEDs automatically deliver the shock. So we're ready for it, but it comes back and says, no shock, advise, start CPR. Get into your CPR. Any doubt, you're doing the CPR. After two minutes, most of the AEDs are going to tell you to stand clear again to reanalyze the heart. Maybe it delivers a shock, maybe it doesn't. Any doubt, you're continuing to do CPR. If the AED does not deliver a shock, don't think you're doing anything wrong. Don't think the machine's broken. It could be that something else is going on with that heart that's not sustaining consciousness or normal breathing. It might be that the heart is just beating very, very, very slowly. And it's not sustaining consciousness. It might be that the heart's flatline, where there's absolutely no electrical activity, could be something altogether different. We don't know, and we're not going to diagnose. We're not medical professionals. Everything I described here today is for us as lay people to respond to that person in need, that extraordinary situation. Medical professionals and EMTs, they're going to do things differently than what you and I would do, but we're going to do our best in this extraordinary situation to hopefully help save a life. Michigan has a Good Samaritan law. That Good Samaritan law recognizes the extraordinary nature that we have here, okay? So not only going to protect you, but the, uh, the, the uh, administrators, the executives, the owners of the company or the school district, uh, building owners, et cetera, from any liability in, in trying to help that person. So again, if it's not delivering the shock, basically what that meant is that that heart was not in VF, which is the fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, the chaotic heart rhythm in the bottom of the heart, or VTAC, the fast, really rapid heart rhythm in the bottom of the heart that results in the blood not flowing. That's what the AED's computer is looking for. Anything else, it's not going to recommend the shock. That's why if you hooked it up to a person, which you're not going to do, who's still conscious, it, it would not deliver a shock. But realize that Good Samaritan Law is out there to protect you. Okay, now we're next step is going to talk about CPR and demonstrate CPR and the AED. Uh, we've talked about sudden cardiac arrest, what it is, its signs, special situations that might, am that might arise in a rescue. Uh, now we'll demonstrate CPR and the AED. Before I do that, I do want to circle back to sudden cardiac arrest because we get questions often as far as what actually causes sudden cardiac arrest. And I think People my age, it's pretty obvious. More often than not, it's that plumbing issue that turns into the electrical malfunction and the person becomes unconscious, stop everything I mentioned before. But when I talked about the K through 12, that's a lot of students, and it wasn't all students in those K through 12. There might have been 10 or 11 of them. And why does it happen in somebody that young? Well, it could be more often than not a, a undiagnosed congenital issue with the heart. Um, Hypercardiomyopathy is a thickening of the heart muscle that creates an electrical issue. A long QT syndrome is an issue in the electrical system of, of the heart as well. Uh, maybe a, a structural issue with the heart that creates a, a potential for a sudden cardiac arrest. Or a blow to the chest uh, at the wrong time of a heartbeat uh, can create a sudden cardiac arrest. A missed uh, fielded ball or a lacrosse ball to the chest or a blow to the chest a karate kick or something of that nature. So be aware of all that possibility. I'm down here on my knees, so I kind of skipped one spot already, and I want to circle back to that uh, in any rescue, in any response to somebody. We want to make sure that we're safe. We've got one patient, we don't want a second one. That person could be down because there's a live wire around. They could have just been electrocuted. We're out in a parking lot or a street, we don't want to get hit by uh, veering cars or things of that nature. So we always want to make sure that we're safe before proceeding with the help. All right? Once we determine the safe, we want to determine if the person is responding. So we want to tap and shout, wake up, come on, what's wrong? Wake up, wake up. Not responding, we want to yell out for help, help. Somebody comes, make eye contact with that person, have them call 911. They have a cell phone, use that cell phone right there, put it on speaker so we're communicating throughout. Focus on another individual, make eye contact, have that person go get the automated defibrillator. Next, you're going to check five to 10 seconds for normal breathing. 
Now again, EMTs, medical personnel, professionals, et cetera, they might be checking for pulse. We don't do a good job of that as lay people. So we're gonna focus on that normal breathing. Remember that gurgle gasp several seconds between breaths? There is no reaction to my action. That's not normal breathing. We determine they're not breathing normally. We're gonna remove enough clothing from the chest, not all of it, but enough of it to know where to do CPR. And that's the center of the chest, lower part of the sternum, okay? The heel of your hand, uh, some say right between the nipples, have your arm perpendicular, lean over that patient, pick your fingers up with the other hand, and you're using your upper body to push down on that chest at least two inches. It's a relatively violent thing that we're doing here, but we need to squeeze that heart to push that blood out to the brain and the heart itself, and then release all the way to allow that heart to fill back up with blood. If you're musically inclined and coordinated, you can think of the Bee Gees Staying Alive song. That's the cadence you wanna be doing these compressions at. Realize that while you're doing this, you could be hearing noises. Um, especially as we age, things become more brittle. So whether it's cartilage or fracturing of some ribs or the like, all that can heal. We're buying good time here by doing that good CPR as we wait for the AED to arrive. If it's a small child, everything is exactly the same. Call 911, get the AED, check for that normal breathing. If they're not breathing normally, you want to remove enough clothing to start your CPR. Depending on your strength and the size of the child, you might just need to use one hand to do those compressions, but again, it's 30 compressions, and if you can do two breaths, all the better. And you're gonna to continue to do that with the adult or the child while we wait for the AED. In these examples, there's other people around. If you find yourself alone with an adult, unresponsive, call 911. Go get the AED if it is nearby bring it back and hook it up to the patient if they're not breathing or not breathing normally. In a child, a pre-puberty child, if you're alone, dial 911 and do two minutes of CPR before going to get a nearby AED. What's a nearby AED? That 911 operator will give you feedback on that, you know, how far out is EMS and things of that nature. As far as the adult, I would say, if you can get it and get it back there um, in the minute or two minutes, that would probably be suffice. A lot of dynamics there. You can call in 911 and how quick uh, they can get there. I'm yelling help throughout all this just in case there is somebody nearby who might hear me. Well, thank you for your time today. I hope this awareness presentation was a, a good reminder and refresher for those who've gone through CPR in the past. And those who haven't uh, learned CPR, that it might uh, be an encouragement to go through that training uh, or just that you are aware of uh, sudden cardiac arrest, its signs, special situations that might arise in the rescue, and how your AED works. And most importantly, the American Heart Association's uh, chain of survival, that early recognition, that early call to 911, uh, the early start of the CPR, the chest compressions, and the use of an AED and advanced life support. A couple last items as it relates to your automated defibrillator. They're mostly stored in a wall cabinet. AED wall cabinets do not have locks on them. You may see keyholes, but that's basically to turn an alarm on and off. All right? Most AEDs, when you open the door, an alarm will sound, just letting you know that somebody has uh, accessed it. When you close it, more often than not, they go off. Some may not, but more often they go off with the closing of the door. Uh, there are signs, very important, that can go above the AED from visual. Uh, posters, if you ever want posters, let us know. We have plenty of those. You can write in here. I call it the billboard approach. The more that people recognize or see or are reminded of the AED, the more hopefully it will get used in an emergency. Another thing we're a big proponent of is the idea of doing drills. 
Okay, for example, in Michigan schools, we're doing five fire drills by law, three torna two tornado drills, and three lockdown drills. But there's no requirement to do a cardiac emergency drill. And there are programs and, and uh, ad hoc committees uh, that are facilitated by the Michigan Health and Human Services, the Michigan High School Athletic Association that's really trying to promote that concept of doing those practice drills. Consider it the scrimmage uh, with the hope you know, a game never presents itself. And that does, doesn't have to be in schools. If it's, if it's a church, or your business, um, just being able to, to do that practice um, will hopefully make that extraordinary situation maybe a little less extraordinary. At any time, feel free to give us a call. You'll have our contact information. And uh, stay safe out there, and hopefully this was a, a good presentation for you. Thank you again for your time.